To start off with, uh, our first presenter is Martha Farah. She is the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, she has also been instrumental in developing neuroethics at a national level. Uh, she will begin by talking about neuroscience more generally and how it's evolved over time uh, and the kind of impact it has been having more recently in our lives more generally. Martha? Thank you, Anjan. If you look at the history of neuroscience, going back to ancient Egyptian papyruses and up through the 20th century, you can divide pretty much every advance that's been recorded uh, into one of two categories. Either advances in basic science, that is, you know, how does the brain work? A very interesting problem in its own right. And advances in applied science, which have been, through the 20th century, almost entirely um, medical advances, that is, advances in the diagnosis and treatment of neurological and psychiatric disorders. But interestingly, right around the turn of this century, in the beginning of the 21st century, a new kind of advance has been uh, coming to us out of neuroscience labs. And this new kind of advance has to do with applications of neuroscience to non-medical problems, to problems as diverse as marketing and business, education, uh, law, uh, human resources, personnel, the military, um, and uh, uh, criminology, a very wide and varied set of non-medical problems for which neuroscience is suddenly offering us um, helpful, uh, helpful new techniques to, to solve the problems. Um, what all of these problems have in common, uh, despite their very varied manifestations, is that they depend in a crucial way on our ability to understand human behavior. In fact, I go beyond just saying understanding. They depend on the ability to understand, to predict, and to influence or control human behavior. That's what education is, trying to Trying to, um, you know, to educate a child or an adult involves um, giving them new knowledge, helping them behave in, in new and different and presumably better ways throughout their lives. Um, criminology, you know, how can we tell who's dangerous, who's likely to commit a crime? How can we influence them to make them less apt to transgress? Um, marketing, how do we, uh, how do we get um, the consumer to buy our product? In all of these cases, um, the, the history of these fields has involved uh, psychology, so marketing specialists um, have focus groups, they sit people down, show them the product, talk to them about it, to try to find out what, what the consumer wants. But we know that people don't even know what they want a lot of the time. Um, so marketers have always been on the lookout for ways to tap into a consumer's unconscious desires, that what, what, they, what they truly want and will truly make them buy as opposed to um, what they say they like. Um, neuroscience, uh, this, is, this is one field where neuroscience has a lot to tell us. Um, we're learning an increasing amount about the, the brain circuits that are involved in, in liking something, in wanting something. Interestingly, those are not the same thing from a neuroscience point of view. Um, and uh, we can, um, to a certain degree right now, read from people's, uh, from the results of brain imaging studies, uh, we can read a certain amount about what somebody likes and what they're going to want to spend their money on. That's one example uh, amongst, you know, several, as I said, ranging from education to, to warfare, of the ways in which neuroscience gives us a new kind of purchase on understanding human nature and what people want to do and what they're going to do. In addition to these technologies that neuroscience is giving us for making progress in all these different uh, sectors of society, um, neuroscience is increasingly influencing society in a more, you could almost call it philosophical way. Um, it's giving us a new view of ourselves um, as, as uh, physical mechanisms. Um, it's uh, showing us how our personalities, our behavior, our motivations um, can all be explained in terms of the behavior of neural networks in our heads. Um, this 
shift in how we view ourselves has implications for many different realms of life as well. Just possibly even more important than the technologies that I just mentioned of, for example, imaging somebody to see what they want to buy. So for example, um, if, uh, if everything I do is the result of physical processes in my head determining that behavior, and those processes are in turn caused exclusively by a combination of my genes and my lived experience, how can you hold me personally responsible for anything that I do? I can just say, but my brain made me do it. So neuroscience may have some interesting implications for how people think about their responsibility. Um, another uh, set of issues um, involves uh, spirituality and religion. Um, a very common, not universal, but certainly very common feature of most religions in the world is uh, the idea that a person is composed of physical substance and an immaterial soul. And yet, as neuroscience progresses in understanding all the different features of humanity in terms of physical processes, that division into mind and, and uh, body, immaterial soul and body, um, is also challenged. So there are many different ways in which neuroscience is going to challenge society, both by the new technologies it brings and also by the new ways it gives us of looking at ourselves. And what we're interested in doing here at Penn is not, um, you know, jumping up and down and saying, oh my god, oh my god, you know, this is dehumanizing, um, we got to stop this. Nor is it to say, oh boy, oh boy, um, these are powerful techniques, we should patent them and you know, get a piece of <laughs> the action, um, or you know, neuroscience is going to solve all of society's problems, but rather to kind of steer a middle course, do what you know, academics are good at doing, which is to try to analyze, understand, assess the promise, the peril, and the hype, uh, and try to sort out what's good and um, foster that for the good of everybody. Thank you.